What's going on, everybody? This is Dr. Adam Riddy, and welcome to the next episode of the One Thing Podcast. Today, we're speaking with a probiotic expert, Dr. Jason Hauerlach, all the way from Tasmania, Australia. He will take us through all the fundamentals of probiotics, and we will speak deeply about clinical applications of probiotics, how to know which ones are proper to select, some of the controversies around probiotics, and we will walk away with a better understanding of how to utilize probiotics for our health and for specific health conditions. Without further ado, welcome our guest, Dr. Jason Hauerlach. I'm here today with Dr. Jason Horlack. Jason, welcome to the One Thing Podcast. It's great to have you here. I thought we could just jump right into the interview and hear a little bit about what brought you into the microbiome space and interest in probiotics. Uh, thanks, Adam. It's a pleasure to be here and chatting about my favorite topics <laughs> that you <laughs> couldn't even get me to shut up about, to be honest. Um, <laughs> Now, uh, what started me was, was I suppose, almost, almost like one of those random chance events that I was in my final year of my naturopathic training, and there was this just fantastic lecture um, by, by one of our sort of um, senior academics on, on what, the, what the data was around dysbiosis and increased intestinal permeability and, and dis, different disease states. And this was back in 1999, um, you know, probably 20 years ago now, actually, it was probably at the time of his lecture. And it really triggered something in me, an absolute passion drive to learn more. And I was lucky that, that I was at a research institution, so, um, and, and I've trained here in Australia where we have the opportunity to do a, a research honors degree, which is essentially where you do a research project. And we actually end up, in the end, doing a um, you know, human clinical trial of, of a prebiotic, probiotic herbal combination for the treatment of IBS, um, and, and, which sort of in my literature, literature review started back in you know, 1999 and moved on and followed that up with a, with a PhD looking at the same sort of topic area. Mm-hmm. So uh, amazingly well-timed because you had no idea about the boom <laughs> that was about to happen, but it just was that, that area that was immense interest to me. And I think it's always been, you know, uh, an area of, of intense interest for, for naturopaths, broadly speaking. But I think there's some that, that it, it just really resonates well with. And for me, that was it. It, it wasn't a, a health issue per se, because I, I would argue that my health issues are mostly lung, lung related. Um, but it, it just something that really captivated me and I just had to learn and delve more. And I'm really lucky <laughs> that I chose a topic that 20 years on, I still find immensely interesting and I'll still read papers late at night and um, watch other people lecturing late at night, which, you know, there's a lot of people who do their PhD in a topic that they really found boring and they just did it to get their PhD. Whereas I'm so lucky that I, uh, it was a topic that I'm passionate about and still am. Yeah. And it's, uh, it's, sort of in the prime time right now. I mean, it's, yeah. there's just, you can't open your browser without seeing a, a study every day about <laughs> the microbiome, probiotics, and, you know, it's sort of, you're, you're there at the right time. Yeah. Well, it, it's pretty amazing to be from, from that time point. And when I was writing my, you know, honors thesis in 2000, like going back and looking at all the probiotic research um, and all the microbiome research. And you could read all of it back then from the stuff that was done in the 70s, 80s, <laughs> 90s. So there wasn't that much. And there's only a few research centers and researchers around the world who were really focused on it and who were passionate about it. Um, and they were managed to pass on that passion passion to me as well. So that, that absolute... Um, love uh, um, and this idea of pr- protecting and being custodian of the of the microbiota um, really grew out of that that early research that was around that time point and certainly has expanded dramatically due to changes in, in technology which has allowed uh, us to see so much more and allowed you know now there's thousands of researchers around the world many many thousands working on this area so the the level of evidence is just powering mm-hmm. uh, new more and more studies all the time as you, as you said before yeah. Yeah. So I think people are familiar with probiotics by now. I mean, people can just go to the supermarkets, grab some yogurt, and they'll see that they're, um, you know, have been customized to have certain probiotic strains in them. And there's kombucha on them on the shelves. So it's not like this conversation is likely to fall in the ears of someone who hasn't heard of probiotics. This is likely to be listened to by clinicians, but also health consumers and people who are dealing with health challenges. But I thought we could start out with 
just discussing the different types of probiotics, the different categories, because it can get quite confusing for people to understand, you know, everything from symbiotics to spore-based probiotics. Maybe if you could walk us through just some descriptions of these different categories. Yeah, maybe I'll just take a step back too and just look at the the, strict, the definition of probiotics. I think we've all got a general idea, but I think there's some wor- bits that are worth teasing out of the, out of the, the more, most commonly accepted definition at this time point, which is live microbes that when administered in adequate amounts confer a health benefit on the host. And if you take that, that definition apart, there are three components, live microbes. <laughs> Number one, so if you, even if you have a, a therapeutic um, product that, that you know, has lovely clinical trials on it showing it works, but it contains dead bacteria, it's actually no longer a probiotic mm-hmm. at that time point. Secondly is the adequate amounts. Uh, and once again, you can often look at, at um, a range of probiotic products on the marketplace and see that many might well contain you know, um, live microbes and they might contain those that have therapeutic effects shown in human studies, but don't have adequate amounts to actually have a therapeutic effect when, when given in that form and that, that sort of recommended dosage range. So that again would not be a probiotic. And the third part of that definition is, is some parts of the world take that, that component where it confers a health benefit on the host very, very um, strictly where you need human clinical trials done on the exact genetically unique strains found in your product for your, you to put, use the term probiotic to describe um, your product. Because if, it's, if it doesn't have human clinical trials, you, won't, you can call it a, a source of microbes, but you can't actually call it a probiotic itself. So I think it's worth teasing out those, those aspects. Because so if, you, if you look at how few products out there that, that claim to be probiotics actually meet that strict definition. Um, and, and a lot of those would be in that category of, of food. And, and even within that food category, you'd have um, what re- probiotic research would call like, you know, sources of live and active culture, which would be typical kombuchas, kefirs, sauerkraut, kimchi, where you're getting live microbes in generally large amounts. It's just that it, they're wild ferments. So you, you really don't know about the therapeutic potential of the strains that you're consuming. You don't know about the, the, the basic details of those strains. Do they, do they have the characteristics that, that, that are essentially um, ex- vital to have a, have a chance of, of producing therapeutic effects in humans? And that would be things like gastric acid st- stability, bile salt stability, you know, so that it can survive transit to the upper gut. Can it adhere to, to intestinal cells? Um, does it produce you know, antimicrobial compounds that might have a selective, you know, decontaminating effect on the ecosystem or you know, sort, of, sort of shift the ecosystem to something better. Um, and then there's another category of, of those, you know, f- food sources of, of microbes that actually I'd, I'd say would meet the definition of probiotics where you might have a yogurt base, um, which would use a, you know, nondescript strain of, of Lactobacillus delbrueckii, subspecies bulgaricus and streptococcus thermophilus. And those are the two, two species that have always made milk into what we call yogurt today. Mm-hmm. But they, they limit in their capacity to have any sort of greater therapeutic effect because in general, they don't have the capacity to deal with gastric acid or bile. So they will generally die in the stomach and small intestine. Mm-hmm. Um, so what, and this has been known for a long time. So what some companies will do will actually add <clears throat> um, well-characterized, well-researched probiotic strains into that yogurt <clears throat> or kefir or Kim, you know, kimchi potentially too. Um, so, so you're actually getting the, yes, you're getting the fermenting bugs that are in that wild, you know, um, varying amounts of microbes, whole range of different species and strains might be there, but then you're also getting these therapeutic strains on top of that. And that would define them as more medicinal, medicinal yogurts or medicinal kefir. So I'd actually separate them um, quite clearly based on the addition of those human, you know, well-researched therapeutic strains versus just the wild ferments that mm-hmm. are otherwise there. Okay, so once um, a probiotic has met those particular qualifications and they do fit the probiotic definition, then take us from there. Um, so let's say that they do have live microbes in adequate amounts and have been used in clinical trials. There still is separate categories, correct? Well, th- I mean, certainly some people would divide them up into, um, I mean, there might be ones that are based on lactobacilli, bifidobacteria based, um, which, which generally were, were 
there's a few exceptions to this, but generally we're, we're essentially initially isolated from healthy human people's poo. We don't like to think of it that way. My patients don't like to think of the fact that they're ingesting, you know, microbes that were originally isolated from someone else's poo, but that's the reality. Mm -hmm. um, so some people have des described it as more human origin strains. And, and the idea has always been that because they came from human guts, that they probably like living in a human intestinal tract environment in terms of the, the pH will be to its liking, the temperature will be to its liking, the, the food that we eat will be to its liking. Right. Um, but there are other probiotics that, that have, have other origins. You know, there are like Saccharomyces cerevisiae variety Boulardii uh, was isolated from the skin of lychees. You know, back in, God, I think, 1920s, um, Henry Boulard was a microbiologist, went to Southeast Asia. Oh. And there is, I think there's, from memory, it's a cholera epidemic going through. And he noticed that, that some locals were drinking this tea made from lychee skins. And they were one, not getting cholera and two, getting better. <laughs> and, he's like, hmm. and coming from a microbiology background, he obviously assumed there was some microbe on it. So he isolated a yeast, which he then named after himself, <laughs> as, <laughs> as microbiologists do, which is totally fine in my books. But, um, and, and, and that's been used as a probiotic, sold around the world since the 1950s. Um, and which I think is, is quite fascinating in terms of the duration of time that's been sold as a, you know, a probiotic supplement. Um, and that, yeah, isolated from the skin of lychees. And there's no other probiotics that come from lychee skin right. that I'm aware of. And then there's the, the sort of, uh, I'd argue, uh, a newer class that, that, that people have brought out onto the market in the last you know, 10 or 15 years, which is you know, so-called soil-based probiotics that originally had their origin from microbes found in, in dirt. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that's uh, the spore-based probiotics? Many would fit into that category. And, and taking a, a, another step back, that, that there's some like Bacillus clausii that's been, you know, it's a spore-based probiotic that has been sold as a probiotic in, in, in Italy for, you know, decades. So that does have a long, long history of use. And there's a, you know, I think there's another Bacillus coagulans that I read about, um, I can't remember the strain designation, but originally came from, you know, cow, cow intestinal tract. So there are some that have other, other origins as well. And, and I, I think that research is certainly clear that it doesn't have to be from humans. Um, it just has to be therapeutic. I think that's the, the clear thing. Mm -hmm. um, and that if it doesn't have clinical trials showing it works and it came from a cow or it came from soil or it came from somewhere else, then there's no way of knowing it works essentially. But right. uh, yeah. Okay. Well then let's go through prebiotics versus probiotics. So um, besides the obvious, if you could just take us through some of the key elements of what a prebiotic is and com comparison to probiotics. Yeah, and, and I think prebiotics are a class of agents that are, are poorly utilized by clinicians. That's been to change, I must say, but mm -hmm. I, I think that's certainly been the case. And I think it's partly due to the, uh, uh, a misunderstanding or a lack of clarity around what the definition actually is, because um, people often just assume prebiotics feed bacteria, <laughs> and, and that's it. Um, and it's not quite right, because there's, there's, again, the, the strict definition is, is a substrate that is selectively utilized by host microbes conferring a health benefit. And for a food ingredient or supplement, et cetera, to be classified as prebiotic, they have to meet sort of four criteria. One, be indigestible. You know, so we can't break them down or, or absorb them because then they won't reach the, the lower gut to be therapeutic. Um, two, they, they act as a selective substrate for one or limited number of, of what we generally see as beneficial commensal bacteria in the large intestine primarily. Three, they shift the ecosystem to a healthier state. And four, there's some health benefit that comes from that, that shift. Um, and when you strictly enforce that definition, there's a lot of things that don't meet that. You know, mm -hmm. like there's a whole range of dietary fibers, which are essential for us to be consuming, but they don't meet that definition of prebiotic because they might feed 30, 40, 50 different species in the gut. And that's not a bad thing. Mm -hmm. It's just that they're not prebiotics by, by definition, um, whereas a prebiotic really is selective. And if you do uh, really good stool testing, you can clearly see this um, on the before and after results of, of supplementing with a prebiotic supplement is you'll see exactly what the research tells you. <laughs> you see like an increase of, of you know, most prebiotic supplements that we have access to now will target bifidobacteria. There are some that will also feed a bit of lactobacilli, um, some that will feed up fecalibacterium and acromansia. Those would be probably the, the four with the best data set and, and another um, group called butyrate producing bacteria, which is a, a broader group of organisms. But you can clearly see the shifts. And, and this is where I think prebiotics are absolutely wonderful when you have an ecosystem um, 
you assess the ecosystem and it's like, okay, you're, you're, you know, the diversity is okay, but you're actually really low in bifidobacteria or potentially, you know, below detectable levels of bifidobacteria. Mm -hmm. Here we can imp introduce a prebiotic into their regime. You can do a follow-up test in two months and the, you'll see almost exclusively the bifidobacteria population goes up. It, it's pretty, pretty clear how selective it is, but you also get, because of the, the shift in environment that occurs with that prebiotic ingestion, uh, generally a lowering of the pH because you're getting increased short chain fatty acid production due to feeding bifidobacteria mm -hmm. generally, or fecalibacterium or acumansia, you, you will get, get a, a reduction in potential pathogens as well, or pathobiont populations. Mm -hmm. And pathobiont is a term often used in the microbiome literature um, that's really describing species that when present in the right amounts um, in the right area, are actually healthful and don't cause any harm. But if they have a chance in, in the wrong environmental conditions or the wrong numbers, it causes harm. Um, and then most of the research around dysbiosis is, is around that definition of pathobionts rather than single isolated pathogens. But what I love about prebiotics is you tend to see pathobiont populations go down with their use, mm. as well as, as species that we tend to classify as beneficial like bifidobacteria, fecalibacterium, their populations actually increase. And you can see massive shifts um, with that. Now, if I got that same patient to eat, you know, more fiber, we're still going to have some nice shifts to that ecosystem, mm. but you're not going to have that same, you know, thousand fold potentially increase in bifidobacteria right. as a consequence of that. There might be a slight increase because they might be enjoying some of the, the fruits of that fiber too, but they're not going to be, be selectively fed in the same way as with a prebiotic. Yeah. I mean, I think that's a really big point right there and helpful point because, a lot of the patients I'm sure that see you would not tolerate just being loaded up with lots of fiber. And the fact that you can step back and say, here's what I see is something that's specifically going to help you versus just kind of taking an aim at the, the whole ecosystem with um, increasing fiber in the diet. Yeah, and and I, we were speaking before this was recorded about the the different um, patient sets we see now, and you know, I still recall the days I could I could be much more broad with my recommendations. Yeah, they were um, a generally you know, healthier population base, whereas now we're seeing people that are often far far farther along in the disease um, process. So, right. Um, yeah, and I think we have to be more gentle and targeted with how we approach. I think people are looking for answers in their gut now more than ever, so they're yeah. coming to us with all sorts of chronic conditions, um, not just um, irritable bowel syndrome or some, some constipation or diarrhea. This is sort of a complex health condition and they're looking at their gut for answers. Yeah, yeah, and that's been, again, brilliant looking at the, at the research out there from really looking at dysbiosis as a driver of primarily gut conditions to what we see now, dysbiosis as a driver of anxiety, depression, obesity, type two diabetes, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, you know, there's, there's very few Western diseases that I would argue that, that there isn't a degree, if not a lot, a lot of research that's built up around dysbiosis as a, you know, potent driver of the, that disease state. Yeah. Yeah. So you've already talked a little bit about this, but I want to go deeper into this, just certain controversies about probiotics. Um, one of them I'm just going to put out there because a lot of people think that if you're deficient in certain microbiota or a certain um, genera of in the microbiome that you could take a probiotic and it'll fix it. And so I want to talk a little bit about your thoughts about that because I think there's yeah. some misconception or uh, gray area around that. And then just any other controversies that you would like to bring up about probiotics. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I think that's a great starting point and that's what I would call the permanent colonization myth. Um, <laughs> okay. I was taught this too as yeah. part of my naturopathic training. <laughs> and if you, you follow that, that myth back and it probably goes back to Metchnikoff himself who believed that, you know, when we ate yogurt, the yogurt producing bacteria would take up permanent residence in our gut. Um, you know, so this is going back to the early 1900s. So there's a lot of, of history behind that, that myth mythology. It's just, Sadly, not, not what occurs based on, on research mm -hmm. that you can look at the last 30, 40 years of clinical trials on, on probiotics and, you know, 95% of the time, there's no long-term colonization um, with their use. That the, If they stick around for a week to two weeks after cessation of use, people, that's very good because you'll see some, um, and they do these follow-up tests and you can see that it's, it's there where they take it, two days later, it's gone. 
mm-hmm. completely gone from that ecosystem. And there's a tremendous body of evidence showing that same thing. So for probiotic researchers, you know, this, this idea of colonization has been a myth for a long time, time ago. Mm-hmm. It's been slow for this message to get out there. Um, so yeah, people do a test. Oh, I've got no bifidobacteria here. I can just pop a supplement and I'll be colonized forever from this time point. And that's not the reality of it. There's very few strains of bifidobacteria lactobacillus that have been shown in research to stick around for any duration of time. And even then it's only in a, a relatively small proportion of people that, mm-hmm. that occurs um, that just might be the right, you know, environmental conditions, but there's something unique about those potential strains as yeah. well. So I think that we have to put paid to that one. And I think that really shifts your consideration and view of the microbiome too, because if you've got this idea that you can just hammer it, take, you know, tons of antibiotics and not worry about the consequences. You can just pop up, you know, a high potency multi CFU, um, a multi-strain high CFU sort of probiotic stuff and you recolonize your gut. Then I think it, it cheapens, um, th- there's no appreciation for the complexity of that ecosystem. And the fact that's, that's not real. And, and I think if you, you have to think of that ecosystem as, as you're, you're a custodian of that. And it's, it's not that simple. Yeah. Yeah. Listen, you could do a fecal transplant, but that's a whole new, ball game in terms mm-hmm. of for getting your head around you know in, you know someone getting other people's poo into your system and that does have the capacity to, to recolonize it in a much different way mm-hmm. than current generation um, probiotics it's just that lactobacillus and bifidobacteria in current versions of supplemental forms don't have great capacity to 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 colonize the gut for any length of time so yeah so, so myth where, one <laughs> yeah and so just to follow up that then what are they doing like where are they living when they're going through your gut transit yeah. And, and it, this would depend on your gut transit time too, in that you would, you would know too, Adam, that there are some people whose, whose you know, bowel transit time is like two weeks. So mm-hmm. they probably will be pooing at this probiotics for two weeks, unlike yeah. someone else who's got a 16 hour transit time. It's probably going to be gone in, you know, 24, 48 hours. Um, but they are temporarily taking it residence. And that doesn't mean they're not, have, not therapeutic. And I think we've got hundreds of clinical trials showing that these agents are therapeutic, despite the fact they're not growing and reproducing in any great amount in your mm-hmm. gut. So you know, just like I'm not expecting, a, if, a, if a, uh, a patient is taking a herb medicine, I'm not expecting them to be permanently fixed necessarily from taking that herb, but the herb is going to have an action that, that will manifest while they take that herb. Mm-hmm. And that's exactly how the research on probiotics is, is gone, is that, that while you take that probiotic, they will produce a certain action. And you will benefit from that action whilst you take it and for a number of days afterwards. And sometimes that might be all you need to do is take it for six weeks to, to get the full benefit of that. And that might be for, you know, maybe the prevention of antibiotic associated side effects and then helping to prevent like a C. diff overgrowth post antibiotics. Maybe six weeks is, is totally enough for that, that action. But there'll be other times where, you know, there are some probiotic strains that, that oh, let's just take say for the sake of argument can um, decrease cholesterol levels. So whilst you take it, it'll lower your, your, you know, it'll break down cholesterol in the gut and you won't absorb it and your cholesterol levels will go down. But you stop taking it, the cholesterol levels will go up. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and there's another strain that, that's used in Europe that produces uh, an ACE inhibitor. Um, and while you drink that fermented milk, you get this in an ACE inhibitor and your blood pressure goes down. Mm-hmm. You cease drinking that milk and cease ingesting that strain, your blood pressure goes back up. You haven't treated any of the underlying issues, obviously. You're just taking something that has a therapeutic effect. Just like right. if I just give a patient... Um, my favorite herb for hypertension is rosella. And mm-hmm. listen, after two weeks, almost everyone has a decrease in blood pressure, but it, if they stop taking it, it stops working. Um, and if we haven't fixed the reason why they have high blood pressure, it's going to go back up. Yeah. So I think it's, it's clearly just looking at probiotics as, as therapeutic agents that have specific actions. We just need to match the action of the probiotic strain to the condition or physiolog- physiology we, we want to change. That makes a lot of sense to me. And um, I think it, it will ground us in, knowing you know how to work with them better yeah just kind of busting that myth so um, yeah for sure and if you look at the what you know there's probiotic trials showing that probiotics are helpful for like cervical dysplasia and and you know mastitis and there's a whole you know anxiety depression all these things aren't related to you know necessarily the lack of of probiotic colonization in the gut or, not, or lack of sorry lack of bifidobacteria populations in the gut and maybe there is for some of those conditions but it, it's truly to do with the action of that particular probiotic strain and there's some strains of bifidobacteria that that you know speed up gut transit time you know, and that's going to be very helpful for a slow bowel transit time or your constipated patients. Um, mm-hmm. But again, it, they stop taking it. If you haven't fixed the underlying issue, it's going to cease working. Mm-hmm. Any other controversies that you that come to mind to you about probiotics? I think one of the ones that that is 
I've been trying to bust for nearly 20 years now. <laughs> it's the, the, the antibiotic issue about when do you take the probiotic along, you know, with antibiotics? Do you wait uh, until afterwards? Do you do it during? And, and I can say conclusively based on, you know, meta-analytic data, you know, top grade data that you take the probiotic during the course of antibiotics. You don't wait till afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, maybe not in the same mouthful. Ideally, you want to space it out by a couple hours if you can. Um, but if you can't, same mouthful will have to suffice. But we know from, from you know, dozens of studies that we actually get less side effects and other studies with other strains show less damage to the ecosystem if you take it concurrently. So there's absolutely no benefit to waiting until afterwards. In fact, you're arguably causing your patient harm if you're telling them to wait until after um, antibiotics are over before they start ingesting the program. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we're, we're seeing a good trend with even conventional providers making this recommendation now. I, I don't know how it is in Australia, but um, are you seeing that trend as well? It's happening more so, but I'm still surprised um, when I'm in, in um, clinical practice how <laughs> frequently or infrequently people get told that when they're still given a course of antibiotics. Just, right. Yeah. You know, um, I'm just surprised <laughs> despite the, because the evidence has been there for a long time. It's not, you know, new 2019 research. It's been there for a long time. It's just, yeah. as you know, it takes a long time for research to filter out and change practice. Yeah. Sadly for our patients. Yeah. yeah. And so one of the, I mean, one of the top aspects of your website, the pro, probiotic advisor is that you go through and you have sort of a ranking of research um, on probiotics and which clinical conditions are most likely to benefit from probiotic use and specific strains. So that is a really helpful resource for anybody listening out there. And um, I just wanted to mention that, but I wanted to go into just a few of these clinical applications um, a probiotic, some of the most noteworthy that you could think of that maybe are, that's emerging and some that have just been solid for a long time. Yeah. Cause I, I think that is interesting because you, you, you go back and, and I'd say what are considered to be more traditional uses of probiotics, which are generally around the, the gut stuff, you know, uh, I remember looking at when I did my literature review, finding studies of, of probiotics and IBS going back to the 1950s. You know, mm -hmm. so that's that's been known for a long time. Um, inflammatory bowel disease, antibiotic associated issues generally that were given afterwards. Um, you know, um, thrush issues. I'd, I'd say those would make up the bulk of, of probiotic use for for a long time. But what's been fascinating is, is just seeing that that shift from. Um, now we're seeing research of probiotics for Alzheimer's disease, for anxiety, for rheumatoid arthritis, for asthma prevention, um, you know, for, for prevention of mastitis, recurrent mastitis, for treatment of cervical dysplasia, um, celiac disease, you know, chronic fatigue syndrome. Um, you know, the list goes on. In fact, there's a, there's a whole large list in, my, in my, my database that you can just look by conditions and, and be listed. You know, and these are human, human clinical trials, um, on strains that are commercially available, you know, and, and, there, and sometimes there's, there's a number of other strains that like there's, there's some research on, on probiotics and endometriosis, for example, it's just that these strains aren't commercially available at this time point um, that have shown great efficacy for that condition. And I think that over the, the coming years, we'll, we'll get access to more of these tools in our clinical practice because that's already happening at a quick pace. Um, but we'll just start having this huge, essentially what I would call a probiotic materia medica um, to, to, co to um, coexist beside our herbal materia medica and then our, you know, normal, um, you know, vitamins and minerals in our, in our, in our um, dispensary to, to help our patients because, you know, there's going to be, soon you'll be have 30 or 40 different probiotic strains you could potentially um, recommend for different health conditions. Yeah. So it's an exciting time to be a clinician really in our field. Yeah. I'm really glad you brought up the point of availability is, you know, one of the, one of the strains that has jumped up, jumped out in the research for IBD, specifically, I think colitis, ulcerative colitis is the E. coli Nissel, um, ah, 1917. Yes. And that's, uh, it seems like it has really great evidence behind it, but we can't get it here in North America. And um, I know some patients have traveled to Germany to get it, but that, it's a really good point that um, we, we just don't have access to all these strains. No, no, we we don't. I'm lucky that we do have access to to the the Nissel 1917 strain in um, Australia. Mm -hmm. But I must say, I, I was at a, a, a microbiome probiotic conference in Italy um, about three years ago now, and and it was like a 
uh, kid in the candy shop for me when I went to the pharmacy there. It was like, oh, you've got this strain, you've got this strain, you've got this strain. And I end up with these huge shopping bags full of probiotic products to, to, take, to take home because I was just so excited to actually have access to the ones that I've read about. Yeah. You know, these are like ones you've read about in the research, but they're just not available here. Um, and that is, is slowly changing. And I think Europe is actually quite ahead of the game when it comes to to probiotic research and, and certainly probiotic product availability, um, but that is seeping through here and seeping through to the North American market. Um, so mm. we've got that to look forward to, but the E. coli one is a different scenario because, you know, it's been available as a probiotic in Germany since the 1920s. Long time in the marketplace, great safety profile, but I think because it's an E. coli, um, North American regulatory authorities are extremely cautious about its use despite its... Ugh, long long history of safe use and you know we're probably talking you know many dozens if not over 100 clinical trials um, showing a great safety profile yeah that that's really a good point and i think you know it's it'll be interesting to see um over the the course of the next few years if we're going to see increased access um throughout the world for various strains and um, hopefully, uh, I imagine it's there's some various uh, forces at play, like marketing and um, essentially, you know, business agreements that um, are required to to bring strains to various other regions. Yes, yeah, and, and sometimes that means there's there's exclusivity as well, like by like Culturel and L. Rhamnosus GG, for example. I think they had an exclusivity agreement on the US market for a long time that maybe just as lapsed or something like that because of this now more products with with that strain in it for example mm -hmm. okay well if if uh, someone is going to shop for a probiotic and let's say they don't have a healthcare provider helping them make this decision what are some general criteria that you would mention oh. That's a tricky question Adam. <laughs> I, I think to be honest you need a healthcare provider to to adequately work your way through the probiotic literature um, and to find the, the best one to, to um, help you. you know, if you're just generally healthy and, and wanting some sort of microbial exposure, you're better off just having fermented foods like sauerkraut and kimchi or some, you know, even some nondescript yogurt. They're all fine if you're just after some sort of uh, microbial interaction going on. And we know that even those yogurt bacteria that die in the stomach and small bowel People that eat yogurt, their, their immune system is ramped up a bit more and they're less likely to, you know, their natural killer cell activity, et cetera, tends to be a bit ramped up. So even exposure to dead, dead microbes, um, which, which is the worst case scenario of eating sauerkraut, kimchi, ki, for example, will, will tend to improve your, your general immunity so you'll get sick less often. So that's a good thing. But if you're trying to target specific you know, health conditions, you're really better off um, either becoming really research savvy yourself, but I think you're better off working with a health professional who already is very research savvy and has clinical experience they can bring, bring to the equation because it's a challenging area to navigate based on label claims. And if that's what you're relying on is, is you know, somebody who's not trained in, in, as a healthcare professional to, to read the label and then decide whether to take something or not, you'll be lost. Mm -hmm. And you, won't, you definitely won't end up except for, for random chance of finding the product that's going to be best suited to help you. Um, and essentially you could arguably be wasting your, your resources um, doing that. And you're better off really working with, with a clinician who is well read and knowledgeable in the field of probiotics and has experience in, in, in helping people with a similar condition to what you've got. Right. So I'm just going to put this out there. So going out and selecting the probiotic with the most different species and the, the highest CFU count um, it's not necessarily meaning you're making a good decision. Definitely not. <laughs> no, I, th I think it's, 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 you're, you're right though. It's a great question or a great comment because there are so many people out there in the blogosphere who thinks that all that matters is getting multi-strain and high CFU. And that's not what the research tells us at all. And, and you can look at, this is a great example of um, antibiotic associated side effects, antibiotic associated diarrhea specifically. And I'll, look at the results of two different studies. One study used 60 billion CFU per day. CFU is colony forming units. So a single bacterium is, is a colony forming unit. 60 billion of four different strains, two types of lactobacilli and two types of bifidobacteria. And they gave it to them alongside antibiotics to try to decrease the incidence of, of antibiotic associated diarrhea and, and C. diff infection. Another study used one strain, um, lactose reuteride DSM17938, at a dose of 200 million CFU per day, 200 million. Mm. So 600 times less 
single strain. You look at the results of those study, studies and you find that the, the four strains in that 60 billion CFU did not <laughs> help reduce the incidence of, of um, antibiotic associated side effects or C. diff. Whereas the 200 million um, CFU per day of the single strain of L. reuteri did mm -hmm. significantly decrease diarrhea rates and reduce C. diff sort of um, incidence as well from memory. So, and that's a classic example showing that a single, single strain with the right action has the right qualities for that task was the best job did the did, did, the, did the work that we wanted mm -hmm. to but the other strains that might be good for something else in fact there are some research on those same four strains that failed in antibiotic associated diarrhea that they're helpful in ibs you know so they might have some for example anti-inflammatory activity in the gut that could be helpful for ibs but they were completely useless for for preventing antibiotic associated diarrhea and mm -hmm. I think that is an example that clearly shows that just choosing choosing high cfe multi-strain over um, strains that have the actions that you're after will, will generally result in, in far less therapeutic outcomes or mm -hmm. worse therapeutic outcomes. Okay, so you have a very eloquent and scientific way of looking at the microbiome based on some of the classes I've seen you teach and so your methodology. Can you just share a little bit about some of the testing you do and what, where you see that going? Yeah, um, these these days because of the the affordability, <laughs> I tend to check the the microbiome composition for nearly every patient, and this has been a, a great breakthrough for someone that's been reading about microbiomes for you know, nearly twenty years, um, and that but not having access to tools to properly assess <laughs> until probably the last you know five or six years, where mm -hmm. the, the the cost point made it actually more doable, and the technology has. Um, come down in price in terms of getting a proper view of the microbiome because the previous stool tests had some degree of uh, certainly helpfulness in clinical practice, but they were lacking the, the capacity to give you a full complete picture of the microbiome, unlike today's ones that really do a good job of that, that aspect. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, you know, I would often do uh, an intestinal permeability test for many of my patients because I think that, again, leaky gut is a common driver. And rather than making the assumption that patients have it, um, I find it more useful to actually assess, and I use the lactulose mannitol test, which I know is, is um, uncool in some circles, but it's still <laughs> arguably the most validated, valid test for assessing uh, for, for gut leakiness. Mm -hmm. And um, then you get that lovely baseline of going, okay, how, 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 not only do you have leaky gut, but how severe is your leaky gut? Mm -hmm as well. And for me, that, that is immensely helpful because it motivates patients because, because healing leaky gut is something that I find, um, because I do lots of follow-up testing after pre -te you know, pre-treatment testing, is generally a three, six, nine, 12 month um, process mm -hmm. that you can see how severe it is. That gives you an idea of what the time frame will be. And it's also, they may not feel much different from, from taking it by a leaky gut healing protocol um, for three months or six months. And, you know, you're asking them to spend, you know, a fair bit of, of not only, only money, but their, their energy <laughs> and, and mm -hmm. timing to fit this into their routine to take, you know, their mega doses of glutamine or what else it might actually be. Um, mm -hmm. And I find it's much better compliance wise if they have a definitive diagnosis of what's going on. And then we also have the, the capacity to do a follow-up test. And I can think of um, one patient, chronic fatigue syndrome, I, you know, we, we did a microbiome assessment and uh, leaky gut you know, assessment and gut was definitely leaky um, and definitely dysbiotic state. <laughs> we, we addressed those two two things and you know working with him touching base in you know, 12 months later and he was about 80 percent better um and, and across across pretty consistently across the board and you know which is which is not a bad outcome and i think we're both happy with that but we're like obviously not totally content with sticking it being 80 percent better right. so we did a you know a follow-up gut um permeability test and lo and behold his gut permeability had improved by around 80 mm. percent <laughs> i'm not not even joking mm -hmm. um but it still hadn't normalized yet. And for me, this was like, ah, okay, this is a perfect example. Because if I just would have done that single test at the 12 month time point, I would have gone, okay, your gut's leaky. Um, but we would have had no idea of going, okay, it's actually improved a lot. It mm -hmm. means that what we're doing is working. It's just going to take more time in your case. And this was a case where it took longer than what most patients would mm -hmm. um, for whatever reason. Um, but I think doing that, that initial testing was, was extremely important in that case first to get an idea of where we were at and, we and how long, much longer we would take to get to where we both wanted that patient yeah. to go. Such a um, great example. Thank you. Yeah. And, and, and I think microbiome assessment now that, that is, you can get, particularly when you're U.S. based, 
you know, access to labs that are offering that testing. An American Gut Project, um, previously you buy them up until two weeks ago, <laughs> or potentially Thrive, where you can you can get you know 16s RNA technology to 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 look at the the main genera and the proportion of that ecosystem for around the hundred dollar mark, and that is a game changer. Mm -hmm. um, I certainly found it to be so. You know, before that, I was using some functional tests that that gave you, you know, a look at, at you know inflammatory markers in the gut and immune markers, short chain fatty acids, which I, I love that that component of stuff too. But you, you might get a look at you know twelve species or maybe twenty species that are in the gut and the more advanced ones. But that's nothing <laughs> when you look at the hundred some species that might actually be there um, yeah. and getting the overall diversity score. And, and those tests might have been for some of my patients. We were paying this is an Australian thing, but you know eight hundred dollars for the test or six hundred dollars for the test. And it's like that's a whopping big investment and as a one off for initial screen sure but for follow-ups you know i was not going there for follow-ups but when it's around the hundred dollar mark for a follow-up test it's been brilliant mm -hmm. to actually be able to do frequent follow-ups have my interventions that i'm recommending made the changes we wanted and it helps you to to gauge dietary compliance as well you know, I might suggest that based on their initial microbiome, you can see clearly what species are being fed and what are not. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are other things, factors that have to be considered too in terms of antibiotic use and you know, probably initial seeding from, from the family too. Um, but you can clearly see, okay, well, your bill of phyla was worth the eyes high. And that species eats bile. Mm -hmm. It only eats bile. <laughs> and it only eats bile really that comes from us eating saturated fats primarily. So you can clearly see relationship going, okay, well, if your bill of phyla is like five times higher than normal amounts, you're, you're generally feeding it very well. And what in your diet are you eating that's feeding that species? And that's one of the, the core um, species in your gut that produces hydrogen sulfide gas. Mm. So obviously I want to know about that population and any, any test that you do that just does culturing as an aside will never tell you about that because they can't find that species. They can't grow it. You need to use molecular based tests to, to do so. Mm -hmm. um, but it allows you to look at that and go, okay, this is a dietary change we have to make. This is what you're feeding inadvertently and i find it really has been immensely helpful for compliance with follow with dietary interventions because they can see clearly what impact the, their current diet or regime is having on their microbiome and it's something but the motivation that's different when it's healing and growing their inner garden that's different than when it might be just looking after themselves and this is a, a funny concept but it's like they're looking after a garden <laughs> Mm -hmm. that they're quite willing to, to do other interventions with and be more diligent because they don't want to like, you know, feed the weeds and kill off their, their good bacteria um, in, in a different way than, than looking after themselves, even though our, you know, they're obviously all connected, but they see it a little bit differently. Most of my patients so mm -hmm. certainly help with, with motivation for patients to, to make the right dietary changes and take the right supplements, et cetera. Um, and they find it fascinating to see the change too. They're super excited by follow-up tests to go, what, what have we changed? You know, I've been eating 40, 60, 45 foods per week this week, eating more of these red polyphenols. I've been taking my prebiotics. What's changed? And it's, it's, absolutely fantastic as a clinician to look at that and go, okay, yeah, I can see you've been compliant <laughs> as well, that, mm -hmm. that we've had the recommended changes or the, what you would view to be the, the normal changes in the ecosystem based on what you're, what you're doing or not. And that also can bring up a talking point. Okay, well, you're perhaps you haven't been as compliant as you had on certain aspects of things. What can we tease out about this um, as well? So I found them uh, there. Uh, to me, there are essential tools in my, my toolkit now that, yeah, this is 10 years ago. I would have practiced without them. Um, but I, could not practice without those tools now and nor get the results that you tend to see but i see now compared to yeah. Tuna. yeah i agree they just have really helped crystallize some of these concepts which um and help us be more personalized in our recommendations yes definitely so back to probiotics just um we're gonna close our interview here in just a bit but i just wanted to just get a few comments about dangers, warnings, and contraindications in probiotic use? Yeah. Now, if you look at the, the research data around, around probiotics, and there's been a couple of systematic reviews that have looked, that have been essentially safety reviews. And they've, and they've generally found that, I mean, there's one systematic review that used, included data from 620 odd probiotic studies finding that there was like no increased risk of any adverse events in the probiotic group versus placebo groups. So uh, no increased risk of GI side effects or infections or serious adverse events. Um, and there was another review done in, in, in pediatric populations showing that kids that took probiotics had less side effects than those on the placebo. So yeah. <laughs> you know, I'd say that in general, they are very well tolerated class of agents. Mm -hmm. um, that said, 
I think there, for me, the, the main caution is around the use of uh, Saccharomyces based probiotics and in immunocompromised patients, and right. particularly those who are severely immunocompromised. And the data tells us those that are essentially, you know, in hospital bed, they've got an IV drip going into the, their system because those are the ones that have had the, the instance of, of fungemia and have been very extremely unwell from, from that. And, and the research tells us that the Saccharomyces actually got in not from oral use, but from staff that were giving, handling the capsules and mm. then handling the, um, the IV fluid equipment. And then it got directly into the bloodstream that way okay. so i think there's a, there's a major caveat around there whereas i mean there is certainly research in hiv aids populations in the you know the 90s or 2000s um using saccharomyces with with good results without any instance of side effects so i think it's just certain types of immunocompromised patients um where you'd be extremely cautious and try to you know weigh up the benefits versus drawbacks in regard to c diff probably primarily mm -hmm. great thank you and um I'd like to just hear some, like a take home message from you. Um, but first, could you just give us a little bit of a summary of some of the things you're working on right now, maybe how people could learn more about your work and, and follow you um, and some highlights of, of some of the things you're up to today? Yeah. I mean, one of the areas that I'm, I'm super keen on and, and this, it goes back to actually when I first started too, was looking at the impact of herbs on the, on the microbiome, medicinal herbs. Mm -hmm. um, so I've always, uh, I was really fascinated after my, my, my honors research was like, okay, what, you know, we know that herbs can be antibacterial against you know, pathogens and pathobionts, but can they potentially negatively impact beneficial bacterial populations in the gut as well? So that to me is an area of keen interest that I'm really keeping an eye on and, and really trying to choose agents that can work selectively, that can work on to target pathogens and pathobionts, but don't harm our beneficial bacterial populations. Mm -hmm. um, because I think there is a capacity of some of our agents that we have access to as clinicians to actually har cause harm to that, that populate those populations. Um, and if used for a longer period of time, result in similar impact that you would from courses of, of you know, antibiotics. And so I think we need to, to have that on our radar. So mm -hmm. that's an area that I'm, I'm avidly <laughs> delving into. Um, yeah, so in, in terms of, uh, and, and I mean, I do obviously have the Probiotic Advisor database that, that you flagged before, which is really designed to, to make evidence-based prescribing of probiotics easy for clinicians, mm -hmm. you know, because we're, we're busy. I get that. I'm busy too. And trying to, to go look up you know, in Medline what studies might be available on different probiotics to, to help this particular patient. Great, you can do that. Um, but we've got a database to try to make that, that far simpler um, and, you know, and for me that this, this database started from bits of paper I used to give my students cause I've been teaching about, you know, probiotics and their uses to, to naturopathic students from, you know, 2000 onwards. And, you know, the, it started off because research was far less of it. You have a few pieces of paper <laughs> and over, over five or 10 years, it was a, quite a few pieces of paper. Yeah. And eventually five years ago, I was like, oh, I need to shove this into a database. <laughs> so it's like right. searchable. <laughs> you don't have to search through five different documents and multiple pages of trying to, to align the, the strain with the research and the condition and where you find that strain and all these different products. Um, so mm -hmm. we can put that into a database to make that far easier. And, and I've also got a range of, of, of courses that are designed primarily for clinicians to upskill around, um, you know, gut microbiome and its relationship to, to overall health. Um, you know, some, some stuff around and vaginal microbiome too. And I think this is another area that is very much under considered in, in women's health, um, particularly around fertility, but, but more broadly about women's health and endometriosis is the, the importance of a healthy vaginal ecosystem that's not dysbiotic. Um, mm -hmm. You can have a dysbiotic vaginal ecosystem and be completely asymptomatic. And this disposes is driving, you know, inflammation locally in the area, but even systemically that hmm. we need to have in our radar. So um, my goal, my, my, one, of my, one of my goals is to, you know, obviously the clinician treating patients, but I really like sharing what I can with clinicians to, to upskill them. So they've got a better data set and more tools at hand to, to better help their patients. That's great. Well, I feel upskilled right now just talking with you for the last hour. So thank you very much. Um, and uh, any closing thoughts, um, just take home messages for, for today's uh, visit? Yeah, I mean, I, I would say probably big things were, were choose your probiotic tools wisely and base that on evidence, independent evidence of, on, the, on the strains that are contained in that supplement, not on manufacturer information industry information. Um, secondly, prebiotics, as I mentioned before, I think are very undervalued. 
um, a, a class of agents with they have a great therapeutic potential, um, and nothing shifts the the gut ecosystem in the same way as as prebiotics. So I'd say, if you're not familiar with the, the class of tools, look at the research and start using them on your patients, and not just gut patients, but you know there's there's decent research showing up for pre, pre prebiotics and their use for modifying the stress response for helping with anxiety, mm -hmm. oh, obesity, type two diabetes. There's a whole toolkit there that you probably don't know about that you should <laughs> because yeah. they're generally inexpensive and compliance is easy. You know, most of the things I prescribe are foul tasting herbal liquids. These taste like sugar. So it's really <laughs> easy to get patients to take these long term. Right. Um, and, and I can't imagine my practice without them. And if you are practicing without them, you're really missing out on a wide range of therapy tools that can transform how you, you treat not just gut conditions, but systemic conditions. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. And I'll put some links in the show notes to more information about prebiotics and the different types of prebiotics so that we can um, pack in some of that learning for the, from this episode. And uh, well, thank you so much, Jason, for being with us today. Um, this was really great. You took us through a, a journey about probiotics and prebiotics and various testing. It was very helpful and I uh, learned a lot. And uh, thank you for sharing this time with us. Ah, oh, you're very welcome, Adam. I've, I've enjoyed it thoroughly. <laughs> as, okay. as you can tell, I'm going to keep going for hours, but yes. I know we can't. So. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. And I hope to catch up with you sometime. Thank Maybe you for we'll, tuning in we'll to circle the back and speak of the about um, podcast some of the other My guest, we, Dr. We Jason Howerlack. My name is Dr. That'd Adam Rennie. I'm the that. host of right. the care. One Thing Podcast. You too. I really appreciate you all tuning in. And please take a moment just to hear some concluding thoughts on this episode and also, please like the episode in your podcast player if if you found it useful, informative, or inspiring. And please share the episode with people that you care about. So here's some concluding thoughts. Um, I use probiotics quite extensively in practice, but I don't use them usually right out of the gates with people. Sure, if someone is doing generally well with their health and they're looking for preventative medicine ideas, we might use probiotics as a preventative health intervention. However, it's usually used in the setting of helping stabilize the gut or stabilize inflammation in other areas of the body, such as with chronic skin disorders or allergies, also using it more and more with mental health conditions. I have seen probiotics do a lot of things clinically and we usually see when they're used right and with the correct strains, better stool consistency, um, better intestinal transit function and the quality of stools are improved. I also see in some patients less anxiety and depression with the right strain of probiotics. Um, symptoms of intestinal permeability seem to reduce such as brain fog and also skin disruption. We also see less gas and bloating. Those are some of the really obvious signs that a probiotic is beneficial. And I am really moving in the direction, like we talked about in the, in the podcast, of using prebiotics and using them wisely and helping people to get more flexible with their diet so that they can expand the prebiotic intake in their diet as we are aware, that's probably a better long-term move um, f uh, than taking a probiotic. Also growing interest in my practice is the, the rise of fecal microbial transplant and its applications to shift the microbiome more permanently than, say, a probiotic. So for now, I think taking some of the advice of Dr. Harwalak and really investigating specific strains not following to hype of claims on labels, but actually going in and figuring out what strain is needed for a specific problem. And then using quality manufacturers that are doing um, testing and have um, proven that there's viable organisms in the pro products you're buying. So this was uh, hopefully as informative to you as it was for me. And um, again, see you next time on the One Thing Podcast. Thanks again for tuning in.